Hello, I'm Lelda Smits for the Capital Network. Joining me here underground in Sydney at ABC Bullion's Custodian Vaults is author and economist Jim Ricketts. Jim, wonderful to have you here again. Great to be with you, Lelda. Now, Jim, you're just about to release a book mm-hmm. next month in November. And it, while it feels like we're really in a scene out of Goldfinger here, you actually reference James Bond's Spectre. Mm-hmm. Can you explain the reference? And also, are you writing fact or fiction? Well, this is non-fiction. These are economics books. So I'm talking about the International Monetary System. And I'm trying to make the point, a lot of people think it's a conspiracy, some kind of dark conspiracy. And I make the point that it's really like-minded individuals. They are working in synchronicity. But I took uh, the organization Spectre, which was first presented in Thunderball by Ian Fleming, James Bond novel from the early 1960s, but also in the recent James Bond movie, as kind of a metaphor for a multinational organization uh, all, all over the world, uh, men and women in leadership roles, and that's kind of an analog for the IMF Executive Committee. Okay, now you did mention conspiracy there, and you've also got a number of predictions in the book. Mm-hmm. Chapter six, I believe, uh, the earthquake, 2018. Correct. What is going to happen between then and now? Well, first of all, when real financial crises happen, the complex dynamics are identical to way to the way er- real earthquakes work. So, uh, you know, it's, a, it's it's complexity. The system builds up, builds up pressure, and then it snaps. It can happen in earthquakes, it can happen in finance. 1998 was a foreshock. That was the long-term capital management crisis. You know, I negotiated that bailout on behalf of LTCM. 2008, people don't need reminding, the entire uh, financial system, we were days away from the sequential collapse of every bank in the world. So I take that 10-year tempo, come forward 10 more years, and hypothesize a collapse in 2008. But it could happen tomorrow, that's the point. It'll be worse than the last one. So what you're doing is really warning people here, but I must say they are very dramatic warnings. And when you start to talk about conspiracies, what do you believe gives your theories weight here and makes them more than a conspiracy, but a fact? Because I use science and I use complexity theory, I use behavioral economics, I use an applied mathematical uh, tool called Bayes' Theorem. It's all explained in the book. By the way, I do it in plain English. You can make it as geeky as you want, but this book is very accessible. But I have some simple examples to explain it to readers. But I put everything, I don't like making claims without the backup. So whether it's uh, legal documents, uh, speeches, uh, equations, science, it's all in the book. So it's all backed up. So it's not a conspiracy theory. It's very, very solidly based. I have read your book and I know that it's solidly based also with references, but really for someone who just may flip through it, what would you say if somebody asked you, uh, markets go up and down, what will make this earthquake any different to any others where the earth still remains? Well, you know, in 1998, Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund. In 2008, the central banks bailed out Wall Street. In the next crisis, someone's going to have to bail out the central banks. In other words, as we go through these successive crises, no problems are solved. Each crisis gets bigger than the one before. The bailout gets bigger than the one before. So who's bigger than the central banks? There's only one clean balance sheet left in the world. That's the IMF. So whether it's 2018 or sooner, the IMF will bail out the central banks with world money, which they call the special drawing right or SDR. So that's what's different. And of course, the basis of this is what you describe in the book's title as being the secret plan. But Jim, now the secret's out. What do you expect will happen any differently? Uh, Actually, nothing. I mean, when you write a book like this, um, I hope it gets a wide audience. My other books, Currency Wars and The Death of Money, have. But, you know, I I sort of write for everyday citizens around the world, whether it's Australia, the United States or or Europe. the, uh, I doubt very many of the, the PhD uh, Harvard professors are reading it. Perhaps they should, uh, but I don't think it will change their plan. I don't think it will change the outcome. But what I'm trying to do is give people warnings. Say, look, you don't have to be a victim. There are things you can do today to prepare for the crisis so that when it comes, your wealth can be preserved. And on that note, what I really appreciated in the book was your superstructure of all weather portfolio. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to give away that secret. That's for people to read. But when we're speaking of gold, it would be criminal not to here in the gold vault. Um, You recommend 10% of investable assets go into gold. Correct. Where are you keeping your gold at the moment? Well, you know, Lella, we're in a private vault and I recommend private non-bank storage. Now, this is a vault. It's very secure. We we have some uh, gold right here, obviously, and there's a lot more in these uh, boxes. Uh, But this is not a bank. This is private. And that's what I recommend. You don't want to put your gold in a bank because banks are controlled by the government. When you most want your gold, that's when the banks will be closed. You won't be able to get it. So I recommend, again, a place like the one we're in, which is a private non-bank secure storage. 
Okay, and of course we know that gold is the prime here, but if we were to look at some gold miners, mm -hmm. what would be the kind of factors you'd be looking for before you invested in a gold mining well, stock? Well, it's a great question, Lola. The thing with miners is that geology is geology, uh, the feasibility study is the feasibility study, the cost of capital is the same. There are a lot of things about gold miners that, that are the same. The differentiating factors have to do with management. There are some great mining companies out there with season management doing a great job. There are some crooks and frauds. So when you're investing in gold mining stocks, don't just sort of do it randomly. Get uh, you're going to run the roller over a, that, that management. So the other thing is there's something called yeah. streamers, Franco Nevada, Royal Gold, Silver Wheat, and Sandstorm. They buy royalties from miners, and that's also a very good way to invest. So, Jim, that's gold, and that's the long term. In the short term, we've got the U.S. presidential elections right. coming up. Trump or Hillary, and how on earth is the outcome going to impact gold in the economy? Well, it'll definitely have a big impact. First of all, it looks like it's going to be an extremely close election. I, mean, I think Trump will win, but it's close. Hillary could win. But you won't hear that. You go to the United States, look at the media all over the world. It's as if the election's over, Hillary's won, she's naming her cabinet, uh, betting odds are 80% in her favor. Nobody thinks Trump could win. There's a lot of reason to think that this is going to be extremely close and he could win. Now, here's the point. Markets are fully priced for Hillary. Gold, stocks, everything is priced for Hillary victory. If she wins, nothing happens because it's already priced. But if he wins, the markets are going to go like this. Gold will go up $100 an ounce. So I would buy gold now or shortly before the election. If Hillary wins, nothing's going to happen. You won't lose much. But if Trump wins, you'll make a fortune. So it's an asymmetric trade. OK, well, thank you for the prediction. And we're at the right place to buy some gold. Yep. Uh, so might be doing that now. Thank you once again for your insights. Thanks, Lava.